Good morning. Good Thursday morning. We just got back from from shopping. Uh, we do a little shopping on Thursday and big shopping on uh, uh, on Tuesdays. But anyway, last night or early af late afternoon, early evening, Enochian Magic came to Sacramento as if it hadn't been here all along. Uh, anyway, we had our, our first uh, a little attempt at a little gathering uh, in our backyard yesterday uh, evening. And we did a little, uh, uh, we sat out on lawn chairs and, and uh, gathered around. Uh, we got to say uh, Sunset Resh and uh, talk a little bit for about uh, a little less than two hours about uh, uh, Enochian magic. And uh, everybody, uh, uh, of course, in order to do Enochian magic, uh, some, you, well, you might want your uh, Enochian ring and you might want to be wearing your, uh, your lamin and everybody got their ring and lamb and, and everybody got a little version of the holy table that they could literally put on their laps as they as they do. Uh, and this is one that I've I've just sort of mounted on a piece of cardboard there, and uh, I just you know xeroxed off uh, the ensigns of creation there and just stickered them on there and and I'm insulating the the corners of the table like we're supposed to with little versions of the sigillum and everybody got themselves a uh a sigillum and uh even a table of nalvage okay and so the what I usually do in my assembly is I take my table of nalvage and put it right here on the holy table and on top of the t tablet of nalvage i put my sigillum de meth so the assembly holy table assembly looks something like this and then uh we put the scrying mirror right on top a black obsidian mirror and it faces uh, out and you sit in front of the, the holy table but actually, what you uh, uh, could just as easily do uh, to serve as a black mirror is to put your uh, your telephone turned off as you as you gaze into the the your reflection in the black mirror of the telephone after you've done all your Enochian calls and preparations and prayers and things like. That. Well, anyway. That's what we did yesterday. Today, I want to talk about something else because I'm very excited because I got something in the mail and I'm always uh, 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 pleased when I get something that I've been expecting for a long time in the mail. Uh, I don't know about you, but the mail has been coming slower in the, in the United States. And I just recently... Uh, uh, learn from the news that that's on purpose, which uh, is not pleasing me very much. But anyway, a while ago, a uh, year ago, maybe close to two years ago, I was asked by David Crowhurst, uh, uh, a, a magical scholar of the of the highest order. Uh, to write a foreword, or he asked me if I would write a foreword uh, to his book, Stellas Demonum, okay, or The Orders of the Demons, okay. And uh, uh, of course, he sent me the, the manuscript or the uh, printout, electronic file of it, and I was just odd okay if i would have had something like this early in my career uh 
it would have saved me years of a learning curve. And, and uh, I found out so much uh, from this book. Uh, and I was ecstatic to be able to write the introduction to, uh, or the, the foreword to it. And uh, uh, our other dear, brilliant uh, friend, Stephen Skinner, wrote another foreword an additional second forward uh, to it, too, which is very, very uh, uh, interesting and amusing. Because as I mentioned yesterday, uh, you know, when I say it's all in your head, you just have no idea how big your head is. Uh, 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 you know, I'm often accused of saying, well, there is no objective reality to uh, 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 to magic that I'm thinking it's all psychological. Well, I'm, <laughs> well, I'm not. And when I treat magic as an art form, uh, I'm not negating anybody else's, uh, uh, observation that it does indeed, uh, have objective uh, reality. But anyway, so it's, it's a long story. So I start off my introduction or my forward by saying that magic is an art. And Stephen starts it off by saying, magic is not an art, it's a science, okay? Or it's a technique. And uh, and I'm not sure he would agree with me, but I certainly see how both of these uh, statements are simultaneously true, okay? And I certainly have nothing to disagree with uh, uh, Stephen's uh, marvelous forward to the, to this book too, but those are just little icings on the cake of an otherwise essential textbook if you are uh, uh, at all interested in the in uh, Solomonic magic. Uh, so, with your permission, I'm going to read you my forward to this brand new it's a gorgeous edition look at the look at this okay i love this dust jacket it's a it's sort of a that's what it really looks like and this is sort of a transparent it's so cool it's so cool okay I'm going on and on and on. Let me read my introduction or my foreword. Magic, or magic with a K as it's alternately spelled, is a spiritual art form older than religion. Its roots penetrate to the very dawn of human self-awareness. In practice, magic is performance art staged for an audience of one. A lavishly costumed and meticulously choreographed meditation projected externally upon the screen of the magician's own objective reality. Magic can generically be described as the dramatic and ceremonial awakening of symbols and mythological archetypes and metaphors performed with intent to trigger specific changes in the magician's consciousness. This may seem a rather colorless and unromantic description of a practice that for centuries held the uh, terrifying grip on the superstitious imagination of Western civilization. For over two millennia, the study and practice of magic has been condemned by religious and civil institutions whose administrators refused or found it impossible to grasp the subtle spiritual dimensions of art or metaphors or human consciousness. 2,000 years of violent condemnation and persecution have driven the practice associated with magic underground. The scraps of literature that have seen publication, often representing the drafts of one magician's diary notes, are obfuscated so severely as to make it impossible for the uninitiated to understand or effectively put 
technique to practical use. David Crowher's Stellus Demonum is a comprehensive, monumental, and scholarly text that has painstakingly dilated the fragmented material of classic grimoires and connected them back to their more ancient and not readily accessible source material. To illustrate what the author has masterfully done, I'll share an example from my own magical practice. Forty-five years ago, I performed a formal evocation of spirit number 55 Orobas from the Lesser Key of Solomon, a classic and readily available text used by modern magicians since the 19th century. I would say the evocation was a success, and I have called up Orobas to my satisfaction on many other occasions since. The Lesser Key gives very little information on just who Orobas is, dedicating only 102 words to the description. And here's the description from the Lesser Key of Solomon. The 55th spirit is Orobas. He is a great and mighty prince, appearing at first like a horse, but after the command of the exorcist, putteth on the image of a man. His office is to discover all things past, present, and to come. Also to give dignities and prelacies in the favor of friends and of foes. He giveth true answers of divinity and of the creation of the world. He is very faithful unto the exorcist and will not suffer him to be tempted of any spirit. He governeth twenty legions of spirits his seal is this, and it just says, etc. Now, while this was technically enough information to allow me to successfully evoke Orobas, it was in a sense like conjuring a stranger whose background and nature I knew little or nothing about. What kind of prince was he? Why does he appear as a horse? Who is his spirit boss? Who are the twenty legions of spirits that back him? Where does he come from? How is his name spelled? Does he appear in more ancient texts? Does Orobos have a history? A backstory? Contrast this with the 911 word curriculum vitae of Auros, A-U-R-O-S, Orobas's real name, found in the pages of Stella Demonum. Background information that brings to Technicolor life what was once for me just a caricature, caricature of a horse demon. Crowhurst applies the same thorough scholarship to entire heart hierarchies of traditional spirits, filling in countless holes, omissions, and breaches in classical grimoires, and giving to the modern magician the opportunity to piece together what approximates a unified field theory of Solomonic magic. Under the heading, The Art of Magic. Magic is an art, and imagination is the lifeblood of an artist. Every artist is a magician, and every magician is an artist. The painter's creation is a painting, the composer's creation is the score, but the magician's creation is the magician. Nothing else. Ultimately, the only thing the magician can directly change with magic is the magician. This is certainly not to say 
that the results of a magical evocation cannot have real and tangible effects on uh, upon other people or circumstances in the objective world around us. The results of a magical evocation often appear to work pretty much as advertised in A Thousand and One Arabian Nights. But such apparent magical miracles, while sometimes eerily impressive, are ultimately the indirect result of the changes the ceremony has affected in the magician's own character and consciousness. Let's say, for example, that you think you love the girl next door, but she doesn't even know you're alive. You get out your key of Solomon and conjure a demon. You command it to force the girl to surrender to loving you. Sure enough, in the weeks following the ceremony, the girl notices you and likes what she sees. You somehow meet and she falls in love with you. Now, in the eyes of medieval magicians or contemporary basement-dwelling would-be wizards, this might look like the Solomonic formula has worked. But even though you might think you've compelled a famous demon to take time out of its busy schedule of festering wounds and sinking ships to bewitch the neighbor's girl, the neighbor girl's heart. That's not how magic works. The girl, like every other human being in the world, is her own independent and sovereign entity, existing free and clear in her own magical universe. Whether she acknowledges it or not, she is her own magician, possessed of her own autonomous will. If for the moment she doesn't love you, it's because presently you are not the kind of guy she would ever fall in love with. If your demonic love spell is to work, it won't be because your demon has the power to neutralize her sovereign will. If the operation is to work, it'll be because your demon has somehow helped you find a way to change yourself into the kind of person she always wanted to fall in love with. Beginning magicians often have unrealistic expectations as to how the spirit appears and goes about obeying commands. The spirit seldom appears as a visible cartoon character or a shimmering holographic image that flies off vowing, Your wish is my command! Instead, things develop seemingly in the most ordinary manner. Instead of triggering a bunch of Hollywood special effects, your conjuration simply sets into motion a sequence of very ordinary personal adventures in your life. Adventures are not always pleasant. And these character mutating escapades often may be painful, uncomfortable and until you recognize what's going on, seemingly unrelated to the object of your operation. But like Odysseus, if you manage to live through the trauma of your adventure, you'll be somebody else. Someone whom the girl next door can't resist falling in love with. Obviously, the dangers of casually tinkering with this kind of magic increase in direct relation to the magician's own level of self-awareness and capacity for self-delusion. It should be obvious that unless you've already developed a significant level of wisdom and discernment, you won't be self-aware enough to know what is or is not in your best interest. The old admonition could not be more apropos. Be careful what you wish for. The spirits are severally efficient, and your orders must be well thought out. 
there must be no room for loopholes in how one goes about obeying your commands. Once your conjuration lights the fuse, the demon will take the fastest, most direct path of least resistance in order to most quickly effect your mutation. Obviously, your con first consideration should be, is this trip really necessary? It just may be the girl next door can only truly fall in love with a man confined for life in a wheelchair. Before beginning, you perhaps should ask yourself, if you're really so crazy in love with her, to pick up the tab for something like that. under the heading, Gods, Angels, Spirits, and Demons. Foremost among the mythological archetypes and metaphors that make up the magician's artist's palette is a vast array of ancient and traditional angels, spirits, and demons representing the entire spectrum of consciousness from Godhead to your head. This hierarchy of spirits populates the magician's inner reality and really comprises the main characters and subject of the book you are now holding in your hands. Like a chain of spiraling fractals of natural forces, angels rule, uh, archangels rule angels who rule spirits and demons and progressively more specialized and fragmented spiritual forces. The ultimate nature of these forces, like existence itself, is as aspects of consciousness. For example, the fundamental force of nature, gravity, could be personified as the great archangel, let's call it Gravity AL. Gravity AL rules sets of lesser angels who in turn rule more specialized aspects of gravity. Angels with names like Mass Attract AL, or Black Hole AL, or Bend Light AL, or Orbit AL, or Tide AL, who in turn might rule more specific or fragmented gravitational dirty workers like Tugal, or Sagail, or Plummet AL, or Plunge AL, or Splat AL, or Sink AL. AL. Quantum physicists now say what magicians have assumed for 2,000 years. The universe and everything in it, all matter and energy, all qualities and principles, space, time, motion, being, awareness, and existence itself are alive and aspects of consciousness. Furthermore, they've demonstrated the mythical and irrational fact that the simple act of observing an experiment fundamentally affects the conditions and the outcome of the experiment. Like the yogi or the Eastern mystic, the magician is first and foremost the observer in his or her own existence. And the conscious act of doing so elevates the moment to eternity and plugs the observer into the mainstream flow of creative existence. And the final paragraph is under the heading, The Treasures of Stellas Dimonum. And it is a treasure. Stellas Dimonum is obviously not a fantasy novel or a book of philosophy. Neither was it written to be light entertainment. It is a textbook, a reference book par excellence, created as a working tool to be used again and again by magicians for whom magic, the magic art of spirit evocation is a passion. If this describes you, I think you'll find here 
the citizens of your magical universe, the symbols and mythological archetypes of your own soul, more real, more awakened, and more ready to trigger the next changes you need to make in your evolving consciousness. And that was my foreword to this marvelous book just recently out. It's, uh, uh, even if you're not a book collector, but uh, just have magic books, I would spring for the, I would suggest you spring for the hard copy, the hard bound while it is still, uh, still available because I think you'll use it for, for years. Anyway, that's it. It's from uh, a Red Wheel Wiser, uh, and Wiser Books. And let's see if there's any other information here. Yeah, it's from Wiser Books. First edition. 2021. Until tomorrow and Saturday, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will.